Hello. Hi, welcome to today's webinar on public, it's back, proposals for the democratic just economy. Wow, I'm just looking at the chat. So many people are joining uh, from different parts of the world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for joining us. I'm Satoko Kishimoto from Transnational Institute. For today's seventh webinar in our weekly COVID capitalism webinar series, we will be joined by four speakers, Philip Alston, Rosa Pabaneri, Srakshana Nandi, and Adlonke Ige. The COVID-19 crisis shows how public services and the people who provide them are truly the foundation of every society. TNI and the Public Service International with 15 partner organizations have just pu published a new book called Future is Public Towards Democratic Ownership of Public Services. This webinar is a chance to build on the analysis on the book and also to reflect on the movement of citizen workers and the local governments who are bringing the basic services back into public hands. Today's discussion builds on the webinar we had last week where we discussed a global Green New Deal. We need a strong public sector driven democratic transition to guarantee well being for people, society, and the economy. A new study showed that 870 different social protection measures in 180 countries were introduced during the corona crisis, ranking from direct cash transfer to indirect in-kind support. Spain and Ireland took control of private hospitals to increase capacity to treat more people. El Salvador exempted families from having to pay water bills in order to be able to wash hands and secure hygiene. Spain has banned cutting off water, energy, and gas supply for those who, people who are not able to pay. But it is shocking to know that all of these public measures to protect people are being monitored by international law firms who advise corporations to sue the governments, claiming they have lost profit because of these measures. According to the new report by Corporate Europe Observatory and TNI. The public is back in many countries, but far from everywhere. In many countries, democracy is in crisis and the authoritarian forces are taking advantage of the crisis to further consolidate their power. And for almost all countries, the reality is that without strong public pressure, many governments will soon want to apply heavy austerity policies, just as they did after financial and economic crisis in 2008. We clearly have major challenges in front of us, but at least in some parts of the world, the window of opportunity for progressive change is wide open. This is precisely the reason why we need to have strong proposals ready, providing alternatives, attractive alternatives to the new liberal model. Our guest today have worked hard in work, workplaces, communities, in, and institutions to build such counter power. I'm very confident they will help us to make this session forward looking and to guide us political strategies. This webinar is organized by TNI and the Public Service International in co-sponsored with the Alternative Information and Development Center, Focus on the Global South, Rosa Luxemburg Foundation, 
and transform Europe. For those who don't know us, TNI is an international activist think tank committed to connecting progressive researchers with movement for transformative change and social justice. You can subscribe to our newsletter for update on our work. In case you miss them, you can watch the previous webinars on our YouTube channel. The webinar is also being interpreted into French and Spanish. So I would like to thank the interpreters for organizing this and making it, it possible for more people to participate today. For the format today, we will have the first round of four speakers. We will then move on to the questions from the floor, which we will have, uh, we, we will give uh, each panelist the chance to respond to. You can share your questions during the session via Q&A option at the bottom of the screen. During the session, we will be sharing links to resources and further reading in the chat box, so you can also engage there. But be aware the questions is in the chat will not will will be answered by other participants rather than the panelists. Finally, if you are on Twitter and other social media, we are using the hashtag T TNI, TNI webinars. So feel free to share your thoughts and reflections with us as well. Okay, thanks for listening to the bit uh, of the house rules. So we shall move now. I would like to introduce Philip Alston. Philip has, has just finished his six years term as the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights. In that time, he carried out 11 countries' visits and written 12 thematic reports tackling issues such as climate change, inequality, and the marginalization of economic and social rights, as well as the role of powerful actors like the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, and the UN. He will continue to serve as a professor at New York University School of Law and chair of the Center for Human Rights and Global Justice. He will just launch a new project called the Human Rights and Privatization in New York University, which we are thrilled to hear more about. Philip, your experience as UN Special Rapporteur showed how privatization of, pri of public services and infrastructure has impacted the vulnerable com communities and families. Can you tell us more about that? How does COVID-19 makes people's situation worse? Thank you uh, very much, Satoko. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be with you all today. Um, I share the, uh, the, the sentiments that you expressed earlier. Uh, this is a time of great confusion, I think, for uh, most of us. Um, we are seeing uh, responses that go in all different directions, and it's very difficult to make sense of them. Uh, some of the most free market oriented governments have acted in a highly socially responsible way uh, and mobilized the public sector, mobilized public resources. Uh, others have basically done the opposite. And the bigger question for us, of course, is what is the situation going to be at the end of the initial uh, pandemic uh, phase. Uh, in other words, is there in fact, as you suggested, and as I fear, going to be a whole second wave of austerity policies, 
following on from 2008. Um, will there be uh, a maintenance of the second wave of national security policies that have uh, been generated by the response to COVID-19? Uh, we are seeing something similar to 9-11 where governments around the world have taken the opportunity. Governments, of course, can't resist such opportunities. Uh, to greatly expand their powers and to cut back significantly on civil and political rights. Question is, how can progressive forces try to ensure that the next stages actually learn some of the most important lessons from the pandemic? I want to speak briefly today um, about COVID-19, but starting off with my own experience in terms of privatization, uh, both <clears throat> TNI and PSI uh, have done a lot of work over the years on this issue of the privatization of essential public services. And certainly in my six years as UN Special Rapporteur, uh, what I saw was a very significant abandonment by many governments around the world of their basic human rights commitments to ensure that all their people enjoy uh, even minimum services uh, across the board. And uh, accomp accompanying that has been a pretty dramatic ideological shift, which we can, of course, trace back to whoever we want to, whether it's Pinochet in Chile, whether it's Thatcher and Reagan, uh, whether it's uh, various economists. Um, but the assumption that private is always better, that it's going to be cheaper, it's going to be more efficient, it's going to be less corrupt, and ultimately it's going to be better for the society. And that set of assumptions, uh, I think, is really dominant in the mentality of most governments and most international organizations. And I think it's very troubling. Uh, I'll explain why briefly. Um, but first of all, we need to acknowledge the extent to which privatization has taken place. Uh, it's not just in the areas that we've come to understand, uh, such as water, electricity, uh, infrastructure, transport, and so on, but it is increasingly dominant in sectors such as health, education, social protection, even criminal justice is being privatized with uh, dramatic uh, negative consequences, certainly in the United States. Uh, another area that I've done a lot of work on is digitization. Uh, the whole push to make uh, government based on uh, electronic access highlights the fact that the internet is essentially a private enterprise uh, that the large tech companies dominate the way in which services are provided. Uh, the movement for uh, ID, biometric identity systems, which is gathering immense steam all around the world, uh, Africa in particular, but not only, Latin America, obviously India. Um, these systems are also increasingly heavily reliant upon the private sector. Um, and that also raises a very significant number of problems. What we're seeing in the United Kingdom today, for example, is a perfect example. Uh, Palantir, one of the largest firms providing these sorts of services, uh, offering to assist the National Health Service, the NHS, of course, saying, well, yes, we'd be delighted. But these are all steps in the direction of privatizing 
a lot of the control of really essential services. Um, what I saw in my work as special rapporteur again is that uh, if one looks at the studies that are done of the impact of privatization, um, both in terms of my own particular concern, the impact on poorer people, uh, that impact is overwhelmingly, of course, negative because no uh, corporate actor is going to see the opportunity to profit from helping poor people and services are therefore going to be priced above their capacity to pay and directed at people who are well off. Um, what is most interesting, however, is that when you look for studies that show the advantages of privatization, there are very few. I remember uh, a couple of years ago, I had a very smart research assistant and she reviewed the paper that I wrote as a UN report. And she said, you know, Professor, this is too critical. It's too one-sided. You need to show all of the advantages of privatization as well. And I said, you're right. Go away, find me all the studies that show the benefits. And she came back a few weeks later and said, you know, uh, I've only been able to find uh, four studies. And I think one was in Paraguay and the other was in New Zealand. And that was it. Uh, there's a new report, a new academic study by some Italian authors, um, Ceparullo, Giuseppe and Giurato, Public-Private Partnership and Fiscal Illusion. Uh, it does a systematic study of all the assessments of, that have been made of privatization in the EU context, uh, where things are supposedly more regulated, more organized, more balanced. And it, again, shows overwhelmingly that there are very few studies that confirm uh, the, any of the claims to be superior on the part of privatized services. So what worries me most as we move forward uh, is that the human rights impacts of privatization are clearly deeply problematic. In fact, what's happening is that governments are essentially washing their hands of human rights obligations by passing over the relevant sectors to the private sector and saying, okay, it's up to you. They pretend that human rights are going, human rights obligations are going to follow with the services, but that has again, not been shown to be the case uh, in practice. So when we look at the current international debate on what the world should look like after COVID-19. What I hear is the UN Secretary General and many other commentators saying, it's time to get back to the sustainable development goals, to take them seriously. Well, I hate to be a, um, a naysayer, um, but the reality is that the sustainable development goals have not made much progress, have not looked like achieving the key goals, and to a very large extent have been handed over to the private sector. If you look at what the Secretary General and others say, the World Bank, we can't do this as governments. It's too expensive. It has to be led by the private sector. I'm afraid that's nonsense. I'm afraid that is simply giving up because if I was the private sector, I would not be worried about the poorest 20% of the population. I would be wanting to make a profit. And we see very few examples of the private sector acting in the broader public interest. We shouldn't expect it and it's not going to happen. So one of the things we really need to do is to look to a different set of principles we have to reevaluate the sustainable development goals. We have to look again at what the UN really stands for. 
in terms of the minimum services that all governments should be ensuring are available for their citizens. We have to acknowledge that the privatization mantra is essentially an ideology. It's not an economic policy. Uh, it is a belief in the view that governments should get out of the way and that the private sector should be running uh, the show. And I think that is deeply problematic. Uh, to come back very briefly to COVID-19, we've seen very dramatic differences in responses. Uh, I am an Australian citizen, although I haven't lived in Australia for uh, all too long. Uh, but we have a very conservative government that continues to be a climate change denier, uh, which has nonetheless mobilized in a very systematic and effective way, has provided very significant public services, uh, run a very large deficit, and Australia has I don't know if it reached its 100th victim uh, yet. It was 99 in a country of 25 million people. Uh, on the other hand, the United States, where I have lived for a long time, of course, we know is the world record holder in terms of the number of people who have died. And what we've seen in the US is a deeply privatized response. The federal government has not come up with a plan on any significant uh, aspect of the pandemic. Instead, it has systematically turned over responsibility to the private sector. It has refused to exercise the powers that are available to it. It has refused to show leadership. Uh, we have a daily reality TV show, which is entertaining, but again, it demonstrates no leadership. It lurches from one position to another, but essentially it's all private sector run. The people being brought in are from the public sector, from the private sector. The people who are in positions of authority are the private sector. Uh, and what we're seeing is a perfect illustration of the fact that if you don't have basic public services in place, if you don't have national health care, a right to health, if you don't have decent feeding programs and so on in emergencies, uh, you're not going to be able to deal with a pandemic. And we know very clearly that the consequences are dramatic for the poor and very manageable for the rich. And so the failure to go down this road is more or less throwing the bottom half of the population under the bus while proclaiming we need freedom. It's essentially freedom for those who are wealthy to continue to maintain their wealth, to grow richer, while the poor are being told to take the risk get out to work, and we're not going to provide the protections. We're not going to ensure that if you get sick, you'll get insurance, you'll get health care. You are on your own. So I think nothing could have demonstrated more dramatically than the way in which the US has dealt with COVID-19, the importance of effective public services and of insisting that basic social rights such as a right to health, a right to education, a right to food, and a right to housing uh, at the foundation of the policy responses. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. Thank you very much. So, um, the, well, I'm gonna to now the move to, uh, I'm, I'm pleased to introduce next our guest, Rosa Papanelli. Rosa is elected as General Secretary of the Global Union Federation Public Service International in 2012 and re-elected 2017. PSI brings together 30 million workers represent, represented by over 700 unions in 154 countries. PSI represents 
over 14 million healthcare workers who are at, the, at this right moment front line to defend people and communities. She is from Lombardia re region in Italy, which is the one with the hardest hit, the places in the world by coronavirus. Before she became Secretary General of PSI, she organized healthcare workers in her region and her country. In these roles, she had su successful campaigns against water and health privatization. Thank you for joining us, Rosa, in such a challenging time. Maybe you, can, could, you could first uh, the reflect uh, the, on the, what Philip has told us and please update us on the situation for healthcare workers in Italy and elsewhere and the strategies you feel we need, need to push forward. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Satoko, and uh, thanks to all you of you for uh, continue working uh, on uh, uh, taking back in public hand uh, public services. I want to congratulate you again for uh, this uh, new book uh, uh, illustrating uh, the many good experience that we have, and we really need uh, to build up uh, uh, the knowledge and the sharing of this experience because if we want to push forward our campaign for public services, we need not only to uh, uh, base on claiming that public is better than private as uh, when ideology is uh, prevailing, uh, there's no reason uh, that, that can counter that mantra but on good examples. And that's what we are jointly trying to do and how we want to work on that. Uh, I mean, uh, I have uh, very little to add to what uh, uh, Philip has just said, uh, because I think we very much share the analysis and also uh, the concerns uh, for uh, the situation we are living now, but also the future. Uh, there, we have been uh, um, uh, witnessing in these past uh, two months uh, uh, many commitments, many statements, many positions expressed by different political leaders and uh, governments. Uh, stating that uh, it was no longer possible to continue as uh, it was previously. Uh, but at the same time, uh, when business start knocking at the door and asking for reopening the economy and saving business uh, uh, and uh, asking people to choose between health and job, uh, well, we see that uh, the balance is uh, not in our favor. Of course, uh, uh, the growth of unemployment and the growth of, uh, um, of uh, well, and the risk of an economic uh, disaster much worse than uh, uh, the 2008 financial crisis is uh, something that uh, um, we, we are very much concerned and as trade union we need to try to, to counter. But rather than pushing to reopen business as usual as they were before, we should start uh, uh, pressing our government advocating for a change in the economic direction of our economies. And when we see that this pandemic uh, um, has shown the failure of uh, the global neoliberal system, I think that uh, we need to look also to the impact that uh, this has created not only on uh, uh, you know, the capacity of our economy to sustain their communities, uh, the people, 
or to um, provide the adequate uh, care that patients in a pandemic needs, but also the weakness, how fragile, how I would say virtual uh, is also uh, the global uh, division of labor. Uh, governments in the developed world have been outsourcing the manufacturing of uh, low technological uh, production uh, to third world uh, uh, countries, uh, developing countries, just because it was cheaper uh, to employ workers there or exploit workers, use the, the, the word uh, you prefer, the verb you prefer. Uh, but that's the reality. And when a pandemic happen, uh, occurs like this one, we immediately saw that uh, uh, facing the same uh, threat, all the governments tried to give the same response. And those who were producing masks, uh, uh, PPEs, uh, protection for workers, ventilators, tried to keep for their needs, for their uh, for their preparing for, uh, uh, for uh, the, um, the epidemic in their countries, as well as the closure of the border have shown how weak is a distribution system that is based on this kind of global uh, uh, division of labor. Indeed, uh, many countries have started thinking uh, that uh, uh, there's the need uh, to rethink uh, this economic model. And maybe even though they are not the strategic uh, uh, production, if uh, they are not, uh, uh, you know, the um, key uh, sector of uh, the industrial uh, manufacturing, some of uh, the fundamental uh, goods that uh, are needed uh, to protect uh, workers and uh, citizens, as uh, we saw in this uh, pandemic, have to be produced uh, at global level. This is opening the possibility of a very big discussion on uh, the uh, division of labor globally. And I'm thinking now to the sector that I know better, thinking about uh, the health sector, the production of uh, PPEs, the production of ventilators, of many different equipment, equipment but we could say also the production of um, drugs and medications uh, uh, that is very much outsourced. Um, but just to think uh, uh, if uh, this uh, confinement and the closure of the border will endure, what can happen to food distribution and how that can hit the fundamental right to food of people. This requires also for us a rethinking how we produce energy, how we produce food, how we produce fundamental um, goods, uh, uh, that are needed uh, to ensure fundamental human rights. Uh, the discussion is not, uh, uh, is, yeah, you know, I, I, I think that uh, uh, this crisis has already uh, demonstrated that uh, there's uh, uh, enormous contradiction in uh, the global economy, but also in the global governance. What's happening now in the WHO with all the limits that the WHO can uh, have uh, and uh, is, uh, you know, just uh, uh, trying uh, to use uh, that stage uh, uh, to redefine a geopolitical balance that is uh, um, uh, uh, currently under question. Uh, it's currently under question how the United States are trying to push in a direction and uh, the uh, equivalent response of China is not helping uh, to build a stronger multilateral organization that can help to face globally a new economic model. 
and probably, uh, you know, under such conditions, uh, the pressure, the advocacy, and the overwhelming power of multinational corporate uh, can uh, influence much more than workers and citizens also in the aftermath of this pandemic. Uh, I think, uh, and uh, we would like very much to take it as a small uh, sign of, uh, of a change, uh, uh, the, a positive change uh, that uh, yesterday the World Health Assembly adopted a statement uh, um, where um, uh, they commit uh, to research and production of vaccine against COVID that will be patent free and uh, available as a common good for all uh, humanity. We will see how it will be produced and distributed and who will keep the promise uh, on that. Um, and yes, uh, these are the challenges that, uh, that we are facing. Also, if we look at the distribution of the, of the pandemic, how many deaths, how many contamination, we can see that the countries where it has been, uh, the health system has been uh, uh, privatized most, uh, or where um, the human rights of uh, people are neglected, uh, uh, and uh, the social and economical uh, divide in the society is deeper, uh, the, the toll paid to the pandemic is higher. That's what's uh, happening in, uh, in the United States, just to mention probably the worst situation ever, Brazil, with uh, uh, two minister of health uh, who decided to resign because of uh, the policy or not policy adopted uh, by the government in a country where poverty is still very high and the need is, uh, um, is um, yeah, and the need to protect them would be higher than, uh, than ever. Um, but uh, uh, coming to Italy and um, trying to, to tell you what I could see from far away, unfortunately I couldn't join my family there, uh, is that uh, uh, mm, of course Italy as many of the country uh, was unprepared to face uh, the, the pandemic. And uh, after China, it was the first country to be affected, to be hit by, by COVID-19. Uh, the response was probably slow, but once uh, um, uh, recognized the seriousness, uh, the gravity of the situation, uh, I think that the response of the government was uh, um, uh, I would say uh, people-centered, not business-centered. Uh, we unfortunately in Lombardy had to face a situation that is exactly the opposed that, that Philip uh, just uh, uh, explained, um, referred to the United States. A, a decently progressive uh, central government uh, trying to inject resources to protect workers, uh, to increase the employment in the health sector, and uh, to support uh, uh, people who had to face unemployment or uh, uh, layoff. Um, while the regional government uh, uh, is being governed um, the last 25 years by right-wing uh, parties. And uh, the disaster in Lombardy, the fact that Lombardy had to pay uh, with 50% of the death and of the infection of the all countries, uh, uh, the, the cost of this, uh, of this pandemic is exactly because in the last 25 years, 48% of the services have been privatized and most of that 
all the territorial services, meaning prevention, um, care of the most vulnerable, disabled elders, uh, childcare, and all of that, have been simply dismantled and referred to hospital. So when it comes that an epidemic hit and the hospital are being uh, uh, filled with patient infected, all the other population has no mean, have no means to be um, uh, cared, to be, uh, to be treated as they deserve for any of the other situation. Uh, I saw just a few days ago that in my town, the hospital was the highest, the biggest COVID hospital in the world with 900 COVID cases for more than one month. And this explains also why people simply stopped to go uh, to the hospital uh, seeking for any different kind of treatment. Another- I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Just, can you wrap up? Yes, no, sure. As a first session. Yes, sure. So what I'm saying is that uh, I, the difference that we can see in Lombardy compared to the other region exactly respond to the theory that we are trying, uh, which is the practice, is not the theory. When you privatize, when you don't care about the fundamental human right of people, a disaster is there and the responsibility, someone has to pay for this kind of responsibility. So going back to normality cannot be that cannot mean go back to what we have before. And this requires that we, as a civil society organization, trade unions and workers have to be bolder and more radical in claiming that change. Thank you, thank you very much, Rosa. So we're gonna to continue. I go, and now I'm introducing uh, Saraksana Nandi. She is a national joint convener of the People's Health Movement India and the co-chair of People's Health Movement Global. The People's Health Movement is the global network bringing together grassroots health activists, academics, policymakers, and practitioners over 80 countries. PHN focus, focuses comprehensive primary health care and addressing the social, environmental, and economic determination of health. She works in Chattizu, Chattizda, sorry, <laughs> I try to practice, Chattizda, uh, state of India, supporting community-based organization working on the health across right to food and health, and right to women and indigenous communities. So Lakshana, could you, could you also reflect uh, on the Philip and Rosa, Rosa's interventions, and then share the impact of private pr provision of healthcare in, in India? I want to ask you, how can the public healthcare and insurance system be extended to reach out rural indigenous communities and women? Is that an idealistic dream? Please. Thank you, uh, Satoko. Um, I mean, I'm very pleased to be here. And um, I think uh, I'll just sort of illustrate, uh, uh, you know, also with examples and with experiences from India, what um, uh, both Rosa and Philip have, uh, you know, very well outlined in their talk. Um, so in India, uh, you know, I mean, we are really experiencing this whole, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, couple of decades, more than a couple of decades of privatization, uh, including of healthcare, and under the guise of, you know, efficiency, quality, competition, and also giving choice to people, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, under the guise of that, which have in turn become the public health system and led to commercialization of healthcare, which in turn then is used as a rationale for further privatization. So I think that's something, I mean, one also sees uh, elsewhere in the world. Um, so the government, the Indian government has been, uh, uh, you know, actively promoting uh, the private sector 
and uh, uh, you know uh, so it's uh, especially the for profit uh, private sector and it's done either by you know direct privatization of handing over health facilities uh, so the current government in the last couple of years has really um, uh, sort of unveiled a huge uh, number of such initiatives uh you know with uh, in which they're proposing you know handing over district hospitals to the private sector and uh, and uh, you know and and whereas on the one hand there is a reduction of our uh, health budget whatever budget is there uh, the priority is on schemes uh, such as the publicly funded health insurance scheme which is basically a way to provide uh, public funds to the private sector um so now the while this has happened the public sector remains you know understaffed and you know lack of availability of uh, uh, you know medicines diagnostics infrastructure and um, so it's like a you know double whammy for the people especially for the poor in which you know the private sector is uh, uh, concentrated in your uh, you know urban centers in your cities and uh, it is very expensive and exploitative and on the other hand you have the a uh, public sector which is actually catering to the uh, to the vulnerable communities to the indigenous communities uh, and uh, to the rural areas that remain uh, very under resourced and uh, uh, you know uh, so and and like philip said you know all this is also fueled uh, by uh, basically global uh, you know institutions like the world bank and now we are also seeing uh, a lot of uh, uh you know intervention in policy making by philanthropic capitalists and you know the various think tanks and the institutions that they promote and they fund so you know uh, so 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 one can actually and, and also the involvement of the private sector healthcare industry uh, in all the decision making so uh, i mean the real question is you know whether the decisions that are being made are really for people and for providing healthcare for people or, or you know is it really uh, for profit um on the other hand when we uh, look at i mean see in, in india does have a large public sector um uh, structure you know from the primary healthcare from the primary level to the shri one and and um, in the beginning of the 2000s the national rural health mission which emerged out of um, a new government uh, that was a progressive coalition um which also had some left parties uh, you know in it uh, so uh, i mean that has to quite an extent improved i mean started improving public facilities public health care in the country however it remains underfunded and um, and uh, you know and uh, uh, and and this is actually starkly illustrated uh, during covid uh, during which we see that um, you know the it is the public sector that has born the burden of providing treatment and medical care to people uh, for covid and it has been the private sector that has been completely missing in action and uh, the few sec private uh, you know sectors that um, uh, uh, you know that are functioning uh, uh, charging heavy heavy rates uh, very expensive and also uh, a lot of denial of health care uh, is seen in that so whether it comes to testing surveillance or treatment um, uh, for covid the private sector has um, really uh, you know uh, sort of uh, as is completely i mean nearly absent and it's only available uh, and is functional in only some of the um, main cities so so see so so what is happening is that uh, i mean the government just does not seem to be learning and taking lessons from it because even now in the relief package it has actually announced a lot of swaps for the private sector and uh, you know and the healthcare sector and things like uh, you know viability gap funding uh, for the private sector and it really comes down to all of us to sort of uh, push the evidence uh, into the policy so i just want to briefly um, over the publicly funded health insurance scheme because it is a scheme that is really advertised by the indian government as the world's largest you know healthcare scheme and uh, but it mainly uh, uh, mainly resulted in publicly funded privately provided uh, healthcare and there has been a complete wider and regulatory capture by the private sector and uh, people are still having to 
pay, uh, you know, out of pocket despite having the insurance. And there is a really a huge lack of, you know, transparency in terms of the functioning of this whole scheme with, you know, even the uh, ministry, I mean, being undermined and, uh, and everything being done under the guise of, you know, IT and digital systems. Uh, but in fact, uh, really not, um, I mean, uh, really not being transparent, uh, you know, with the data. So in that, we see that the vulnerable groups like indigenous populations, rural uh, population who are entitled to uh, coverage under the scheme are covered, but they are not able to utilize, uh, you know, the scheme. And the, uh, because it's mainly being utilized in the urban areas with the private sector, which is getting majority of the funds, uh, you know, of the scheme. So, but, you know, all is uh, really uh, not lost, um, you know, in that way. And, uh, and in India, we do see that um, there are more progressive states that have, you know, introduced or uh, more progressive policies. And, uh, and, and it also really clearly shows that, you know, states that have prioritized the public sector um, strengthening really show the better health indicators. And um, so, you know, you can look at uh, Kerala, you can look at Tamil Nadu, um, and even the state that uh, I'm in Chhattisgarh, there has been in the last couple of years uh, uh, sort of an attempt to uh, prioritize the public sector over the private uh, sector. And, 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 you know, that whole, uh, I mean, people, you know, keep saying whether, uh, you know, is it possible to strengthen the public sector? But I think we have enough examples within our country to show that it is possible in one of, in a few of our districts, which are the most conflict affected districts, you know, there's armed uh, um, uh, conflict between the state and um, Maoists. Uh, in those districts, the district administrations have managed to really improve, radically improve the public hospitals and, you know, leading to a huge increase in the number of type of services, number of patients. If it can be done in the most difficult of, uh, you know, districts in the country, why can't it be done uh, elsewhere, you know? So uh, that's really a question. Um, and uh, I mean, even um, during COVID, uh, you know, we have found such states which had prioritized the public systems and also have better public uh, programs, uh, social protection programs, uh, food uh, uh, food security programs, they are the ones, with, uh, you know, who are more efficiently uh, sort of able to respond uh, to the crisis. So finally, I think, you know, I mean, India should really learn its lessons of the way, uh, you know, the private sector has really um, sort of uh, not really stepped up and uh, uh, to the, the, the whole crisis, responding to the crisis and uh, and, and, and later we can talk about, you know, how to sort of go about it and take these lessons uh, forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lakshana. So let's move on next to our guest. Uh, we will hear from Adolonke Ige. She's from Nigeria. Adolonke is a policy advisor at the Environmental Rights Action, Friend of the Earth Nigeria, working on water campaigns and climate justice across Africa. She's ad she has undertaken several public interest advo advocacies through community organizing and grassroots mobilization. As a lawyer, she carried out advocacy and campaigns at grassroots and underserved communities and has engaged with Ava Wata, Our Right campaign, she will tell, tell us about, as well as African Women Water Sanitation and Health Network. Again, I would like to ask Adolonke to first reflect on what has been said uh, by our, our old friends. Please share how you see human rights and the public service as a community organizer in Lagos, Nigeria. Thank you very much, Satoko. Um, and um, thank you to other um, speakers that have um, spoken before me because um, we can't overemphasize the fact that prioritization of people's rights and welfare should be the primary thing, you know, with government or even in any society. So the moment you begin to see the opposite, that's when you begin to know that there's doom lying in the corner. So um, one of the things that the pandemic has come to reveal more than ever is the fact that you cannot leave public good in private hands. 
you cannot do that. Otherwise, what you will see is also doomed. So, um, so far, I think I'll just talk briefly about the uh, What Are Our Right campaign, which was a child of necessity, which has also come to show um, what we have talked about over time, over time. We have talked about how there's a need to invest in the public sector to make it effective, to ensure that the people own their own good. It's a collective development and government is increasingly responsible when it comes to public services. So the Our Water RI campaign is a child of necessity. It's a unique one and it is peculiar. And I'll lay a little background. Why is it peculiar? Because Lagos, Nigeria's most prosperous state, with a population of 21 million people, has all the resources at its disposal to provide safe and affordable public water to its people. So the problem isn't lack of resources, but we have seen a lack of political will, and it's over time, accompanied often by the capitalist philosophy of you know, commodifying every public good, including water, unfortunately. So the water situation in Lagos is such that Despite having an impressive economy with internally generated revenue of more than 200 million US dollars monthly, the Lagos government has failed, just like several others that we see around, to prioritize universal access to water. So that means that 80% um, of Lagos residents, um, according to statistics and research, they depend on unwholesome sources of water to meet their daily needs. Unfortunately as well, women and young girls carry the biggest burden on ensuring that there's water in the home. They contend with daily drudgery of waking up really early, going long distances, risking their lives and safety to ensure that they get water for even the simplest of sanitary purposes and other domestic uses. So it's, it's um, unfortunate and it's what we keep saying. And that's why I say also that the pandemic has come to reveal to us, has come to expose the gap in the system and why we have to take public ownership and why we have to be publicly responsible to the people. The welfare of the people has to be primary. So the campaign is very unique because for the first time, years after civil society and labor teamed up to boot out the military um, out of power and install democracy in Nigeria, the need to pre preserve water as a public good became a factor that would once again bring the civil society, the labor movement, grassroots movement, women groups, youth groups, everybody coming together, marching shoulder to shoulder. And that's how the uh, Water Our Rights Coalition was born. That was back in 2014. So it's, um, what we had to do was what we saw that was really missing, building grassroots power, building women power, and so on. And have we had challenges? Definitely. But because we also know the danger of privatization, when you leave um, the, the general welfare of people in the hands of people whose aim basically is to make profit, we know the danger of that. We have seen the danger of that. And that's the reason also that what has been declared a human right. So have there been challenges? Definitely. Have there been victories? Also definitely. So um, our water right campaign, for instance, has caught several resounding wins in keeping water public so far. You know, from truncating corporate private, um, privatization agendas to resisting enactments that would have otherwise imposed untoward hardship on the majority of the public. But by far for us also, um, the most successful outcomes uh, would be that the two successive administrations, that would be between 2014 and 2019, have tried strenuously to privatize water in Lagos, but have also failed woefully in their bid to push the agenda through because of the pressure of our campaign. So, you know, we have seen administrations come and go and trying to promote privatization. But because also we have given the power to the people and we have allowed the people to champion their own cause, we've been winning that war so far. So one of the things we need to consolidate this period is that we need to learn that we, we cannot relent right now. We can't rest on our oars. We will continue to engage among pressure and we need to have an unflinching focus and resilience until we have a definite win. And for us, what would be the definite win? The win is when the government listens to the voices who carry the greatest burdens of water depriv deprivation 
And who are those? Those are the people who are mainly vulnerable in the communities, people who are everyday users of water, people for whom public service should not become a matter of affordability or wealth, but a matter of right, which is supposed to be. So that is what we are about. And that's what we have seen so far. And that's why I'm happy about the premises that have been laid because it shows once again that now more than ever, we need to push, we need to come together. We need to know that now is not the time to say, oh, we have arrived or we have achieved it. It's a step in the right direction. And now the pandemic has shown us certain things and we know we can move from there and ensure that public services remain in public hands and are effectively managed for the good of everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adelonke. Well, that's so powerful to hear from you. Okay, we have heard uh, the, for, uh, for our guest, the, well, the, the Adelonke ended her contribution perfectly to move our discussion forward. And I have got uh, very good questions already. Well, we have uh, the, the why public ownership of essential services matters why mobilization to build political power matters, and why having strong proposals for building universal demo democratic public service matters. That's what we are talking about. So let's uh, have another um, the round the, of the, the question to, to respond to some questions. Thanks for uh, all those who are putting uh, questions and the comments. It's very encouraging to, to learn the, the chat as well. Well, Philip, I would like to ask you first, you have got a specific question, uh, which let me, let me read uh, for all to Philip. If you can say a bit about privatization of money, as money tend to be uh, created by big private banks, how we can make the money system fairer and more healthy in order to achieve the social development, so the sustainable development goals. Uh, well, um, thanks to Turco. I'm, I'm not sure exactly what the question is getting at. I could see it at uh, focusing on two very different levels. One is the overall financial system. In other words, why is it that the uh, large banks are so dominant? Um, but the other is just how do we uh, promote a more inclusive financial system uh, for all people. Uh, and I think that there is a lot of movement uh, in terms of uh, what they call financial inclusion. Uh, but again, it ends up being dominated by a lot of the large corporations. MasterCard, for example, uh, was, I think at one stage, uh, MasterCard actually had its logo on the Nigerian national ID card. Uh, in other places in Africa, MasterCard has sort of volunteered to be transferring benefits, uh, but that has then led them, as it did in South Africa, to uh, facilitate lending services, which were at very bad rates and got people into a lot of difficulty. Uh, so I think we need to be very vigilant, even when we see efforts to make the financial system much more accessible to the poor. And again, the bottom line is that there's no substitute for effective governmental oversight and monitoring and that the outsourcing of those sorts of responsibilities to the private sector uh, needs to be strictly limited. Thank you, Philip. So now I have got uh, the specific question as well to Sulakshana. Let me read the, yes. Yeah, Sulakshana, are you there? Yeah. If you can explain why public health systems are so important from a gender perspective and how you can, we can build a gender transformative public health services system. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, from our work and, uh, you know, from even our research, so what, uh, what really um, build and responsive system first, it, 
it really needs to be near to where you are you know especially when you're looking at uh, you know geographical activity if you're looking at uh, uh, rural areas areas where indigenous communities uh, live so one of so the one thing is about the accessibility so uh, so your private sector uh, is not going to um, i mean even now when the government tries and outsources its services to public private partnerships um a scheme of inter um, uh, scheme after scheme what has happened the private sector has refused to go to the remote uh, you know areas so it is the public system that can develop a system from the community uh, you know ensuring continuity of care through the whole system up to the tertiary level which is rational which is uh, free and uh, you know and which also needs to be sensitive to people's needs uh, and so so when we talk about women so this requirement actually also uh, sort of it um, requirement uh, is more emphasized you know because there are a lot of um, uh, issues of uh, mobility of resources and uh, uh, and discrimination that women face so uh, in india we i mean uh, so, so for example in the state that i am in uh, uh, there is a it, it was one of the first states to uh, have a large very large community health work program the methanin program and there are around 70000 uh, community health workers which i mean lessons from there were later taken up for the national asha uh, community health worker program and our experience has been that um, uh, that that has uh, you know uh, that has really led to women being able to access healthcare and uh, and and access uh, healthcare near to where they are and also public sector is then able to respond more to their needs because now there is uh, somebody to support them um, of course there are a lot of issues still regarding payment of the community health workers and resourcing the public sector workers uh, you know adequately so that they are able to do their job and also equip them adequately but um, uh, you know having I, i think for equity and and especially for women uh having a public sector that is easily accessible and uh, uh free uh is something uh, that we have found has really uh, helped uh, you know women to access um, healthcare thank you sakshana thank you very much so i have got uh, i now i want to ask uh, rosa and adalonke i think you can choose uh, the questions uh, they let me read uh, this is people want to know about more proposals as what we can do in other words how to tackle the, the the face of privatization how to tackle the overwhelming power corporation have over government how and how to not to only we gain power over government and cooperation but also build collective and more autonomous power within society wow okay that's one another question uh, you can choose the yes the how can covid-19 recovery plans tackle pandemic and uh, uh, the planet breakdown including ending privatization and build democratic public ownership could i ask uh, uh, rosa first yeah uh, thank you very much well i mean i'm not going uh, to respond to how we, we need to build an alternative power because this is a very long term uh, you know objective and uh, we need to prepare for that uh, but i think there's many things that we need to do that we can do and we need to do uh, right now right now the first the thing is that uh, we need to ask our government uh, to immediately introduce a tax on wealth this is something that is very needed and it's no longer postponable it's not possible to postpone further uh we need to ask our government to immediately introduce a taxation on uh, uh, it corporates and digital corporates 
these big uh, uh, companies are the only one probably uh, that will gain from this crisis because from uh, Amazon to Google uh, to all those platforms have been making money in this uh, time of confinement. And we are contributing to increase uh, their uh, profits and their wealth. So we need to ask a government to, to immediately introduce. And we cannot wait uh, for the OECD to define, uh, the, to verify how the BEPS program is going. We have our proposal and that's what we have to do. I think that supporting um, um, economic recovery means also creating jobs and creating jobs, decent jobs and decent uh, uh, working conditions. Uh, uh, one of the things that have uh, um, uh, weakened our capacity of workers uh, to defend our fundamental human right is the uh, uh, the fact that uh, our uh, work has been made flexible, precarious, uh, with no rights, uh, and uh, that cannot longer be uh, the situation. So jobs, uh, investing in public services, investing in uh, local communities uh, is uh, a key response uh, to a different uh, model of development. And the resources are there because if you look at the shameful tax evasion, uh, the money hidden in tax havens, and uh, the tax uh, benefits uh, allowed uh, to many corporates, particularly in the global south, eh, but not only, well, this is uh, uh, the normal that we have to change. Thank you, Rosa. Um, we are so aware, you know, you are the, the PSI and the other uh, labor um, unions you know, together with many, many organizations are really pushing such, you know, big agenda, which is, not, which has to be normal, you know, after uh, the pandemic. And, and if I can add just uh, uh, in one word, this is the time to cancel the debt. There cannot be lending from IMF, from any financial institution under conditionalities of repaying the debt. Can't work. Thank you, Rosa. Let's, let's make sure that at least, you know, that's the most important things to, ha to happen uh, in the near future. So now I, I invite uh, the Lonke. Uh, the, you can also answer the, the question about building, you know, kind of a, the collective power, uh, not on, of course, cooperation, the government in front of us, but our collective power, particularly your engagement for women uh, in the women com community, that sounds very, very important. Um, yes, and also the, the, yeah, that's, I don't get please. Thank you very much. So I think um, one of the main things is that when we identify the people who truly matter when we are talking about public services or when we are talking about public good in general, it helps. So when um, without public or people participation, we are likely to go wrong. So you can't take a decision about public or about the people and the people are not generally present. And I think that's one of the strengths of our campaign so far. Every campaign we've had, particularly on water. Because from the onset, the communities were prime voices in the campaigns, given a platform to share their experiences, the failure of government and the, um, and the failure to even consult them in decision-making and how they can provide their own solutions and be at the center of things. So it's very important building grassroots power, making people part of the process, you know, or, um, in delivering public service or even essential goods. So that's really important. Then another thing that um, would work is increased budgetary allocation. We can't say it enough. You know, sometimes we talk about um, lack of political will. Of course, we see that all the time. But then also, it's a failure of prioritization. When we prioritize the things that matter, and then we know that a failure to effectively manage these things will lead to an overall failure. It will ensure that we bring the people that matter to the table. So I will talk um, again 
briefly about the um, water campaign in Lagos and what, how we were able to manage that successfully, building grassroots power, building women power. So from the beginning, recognizing the need for women to play an active role in decision making on water at all levels um, was, uh, was the one of the cornerstones of the first Lagos Water Summit that we organized. That was the coalition in 2015. And that was how the Africa Women Water Sanitation and Hygiene Network, AWASHNET, was, was born. And AWASHNET now has a membership drawn from civil society, grassroots communities, labor unions, working collaboratively to challenge water privatization, you know, just all over the country. And it's now a leading platform of women and girls whose voices used to never be heard in decision making. So it might interest you to know that in 2018, March, um, this network led one of the most successful rallies against water privatization in Lagos and the principal forces had hundreds of women you know just from across board and proffering solutions to one problem that was identified so that comes to tell us again that the people have solutions within them the people have power so how do we carry them along that's one thing then finally just shortly um you know recently we saw like in the 2000s, early 2000s, there was a major challenge on security. And that also, as we have it, it, it's always the capitalist philosophy and it was mostly privately managed. But when that became a, a, a situation, a major challenge in, in the state, we, it, a, a trust fund was created for that and it was publicly managed. And we saw tremendous change. Now, Lagos cannot say, for instance, that security is one of his greatest challenges. We did that. So why can't we do that for every other public service and essential service? So it is doable. It's just a matter of prioritizing and then having the political will to do what is necessary per time. So that alone, then we cannot speak about the people without the people. The people always to be at, have to be at the table. So for us who do this work of organizing, campaigning, and so on, we have to realize that now more than ever, we need the strength of solidarity and collaboration, and then we can prefer solutions. Thank you, Adalonke. Wow, powerful. Okay, this is really the, the something uh, I'm so happy to hear. Um, well, the one question, uh, let me introduce uh, the in which countries did renationalization and remunicipalization of healthcare services take place? And what were the forces behind to return to publicly owned health services? Well, I would love to uh, introduce our new book that uh, has uh, quite some answers here. So that uh, uh, you can see the chat the uh, future in public. We, we will have the public database on that. And I also, I'm happy to, to say that we're gonna to focus on healthcare, uh, the hospitals, failed private, uh, private hospitals to, to going back to uh, public uh, ownership together with the People's Health Movement. movement. So that's another, our new agenda as uh, TNI and other uh, partners. Having said so, this is the last uh, uh, remark I want to hear. You don't have to, but perhaps this, the, the question, the public is back. But we are, we, are, we are kind of picky, specific about what kind of public we want to have. That's what Adalonke also told us. If you want to say a last remark, last thought on the public ownership, what we want to look at, uh, please. So that's, that's our last round. Anybody wants to contribute? Yes. I think uh, what one would definitely love to see, it's a, it's a public that is truly public public that belongs to the public. So when a few take control of the resources of all and then marginalize and then things that are right begin to look like a matter of affordability or wealth or your status in society, then we're going nowhere. So what I would love to see and what I believe that, you know, everyone who does this work of development would love to see is a public that is really truly public, a public that belongs to the public, not a select few. Thank you, Adalonke. I think we can go last round for all. Uh, can I uh, invite Philip? Um, I think one of the um, one of the problems we have in the human rights area is that we divide human rights up into two so-called sets of rights: civil and political rights on the one hand, and economic, social, and cultural on the other. 
And we tend to fall into the trap of focusing on one or the other. But I think what we're seeing in the pandemic, for example, is the marginalization of civil and political rights. You've got the declaration of emergency powers. You've got the limits on protests. You've got the inability of people to really uh, to demonstrate, to get out and mobilize. Um, and no attempts made to reach a balance. And that in turn has a big impact on the people's ability to demand respect for their rights generally, but particularly uh, as Adaronka said, their right to water, or, or as Sodashana said, the right to health uh, and so on. So I think we need to also watch very carefully what we call the closing of civic space, uh, which has shrunk pretty dramatically during this pandemic and will uh, restrict very much our capacity to mobilize effectively for the sort of objectives that we're all talking about today. Thank you, Philip. I ask you, uh, Slakshana, please uh, share yeah. your last remark. Yeah. Uh, so I think I'll just say that, you know, I mean, in terms of public, I think the two keywords for me are, uh, you know, uh, equity and solidarity, because, you know, we also need to be very conscious of power relations, uh, you know, among uh, within groups. So, you know, to uh, ensure that the most vulnerable are actually getting the voice uh, into the decision making. And uh, uh, so that's, uh, you know, one thing. Uh, secondly, I just wanted to share because there were a number of questions in the in the box on this about you know, how to get this forward. And I want to share that the people's health movement in many countries, uh, including in India, um, and you know whether it's Philippines, uh, in, in Europe, uh, PHM Europe. Uh, uh, I mean, also in South Africa. So I have been undertaking a lot of struggle and campaign against privatization of health services and some of the resources we had given in the chat box. I think some of the lessons that I would like to share from that is one is build evidence. You know, it's very important for us to build that evidence um, and, you know, have an evidence-based critique, you know, to really go, uh, you know, and talk about uh, uh, what, what the problem uh, is. Secondly, information, you know, dissemination of information and through popular material as academic publications and things like that so that's also very important because for the, the people in power information is the most powerful thing that they sort of keep and you know they don't want to tell people what the, what is the exact contract that the government has signed with that private organization so for us it's very important to get that information disseminated building alliances with progressive uh, you know, movements and, and what we have found was very successful is uh, having privatization and neoliberal policies as a rallying point. The solidarity with, you know, movements of, uh, you know, workers' movements of, of forest uh, dwellers. I mean, everybody who has been facing a lot of uh, sort of onslaught on their uh, life and livelihood, uh, you know, with regards to, uh, due to privatization and neoliberal policies. So building, uh, you know, broader movements and alliances. And uh, so, so these are some of the lessons I would uh, like to share uh, at the end. Thank you. Thank you, Slakshana. So now I want to uh, invite uh, Rosa, then you, you will ask, push forward, look forward, looking, ending this webinar, looking uh, forward, looking. Well, uh, I think that uh, we have a lot of work to do and uh, trying to be consistent uh, in uh, our action and our claims. And I also believe that uh, democracy has been really threatened uh, under this, uh, this pandemic. Our individual freedom, our individual civil and social rights, but also the foundation of our uh, uh, of our democracy. And I would like to conclude uh, with uh, uh, an, a small aspect. We have, uh, uh, but is very important. Uh, many of our members have uh, reported uh, that uh, they have been uh, threatened uh, because they were uh, releasing reports of how the real situation was in hospitals. And we have examples of many workers that have been fired 
because they reported to the police what happened in some of the structure, particularly in elder care house, uh, homes. Uh, this is uh, a limitation of the individual freedom of workers, but it's also a limitation to our capacity to express, uh, of expression, our right of, to expression, and uh, our fundamental right as citizens to be part of a democratic society that we cannot allow to continue. Thank you. Thank you, Rosa. Thank you so much for all our guests and all, uh, all of you uh, for joining us. Thank you as well, uh, the whole en the entire TNI team for, uh, for the, their great organizational support and all the co-sponsors of this webinar. We will find the uh, uh, chat uh, the, now the, their website, our co-sponsors. We really suggest you, you to consult them uh, they are, uh, as their work covers a very wide range of the issues we have talked today. We also encourage you to check out our, uh, our the free book, we, uh, The Future is Public, for analysis and inspiring cases, case studies from around the world. Tomorrow, we encourage you to join two webinars. Well, Tomorrow, only tomorrow we have two, I believe. The TNI is co-sponsoring that the first one is at 3 p.m. We'll look, look at the militarism in the time of COVID and we'll feature, uh, feature TNI fellow, Phyllis Dennis. Then at 5 p.m., there will be the webinar on the trade rules that we need to, for climate action, which is part of the global uh, Green, New, sorry, sorry, Green New, New Deal series we are co-sponsoring organized by Rosa Luxemburg Foundation and Transform Europe. Both links are posted in the chat. Then our usual Wednesday webinar next week on 27th of May will focus on feminist responses to the pandemic and the crisis of democracy. It will include Silvia Federici and other inspiring uh, the feminist thinkers and the activists. So you should, uh, it should be brilliant, we promise. You can register via the, our website now and the link is the chat for you. TNI is committed to keep organizing webinars as global learning space to connect progressive communities. If you find our work valuable, Thank you for considering your donation. Your support makes difference. Will keep us, keep us going. Thank you once again for joining us and we will leave the chat open for five minutes more. So please wrap up your resources and the chat conversations. Thank you so much for especially all our guests who are ex joining us at extremely busy and challenging time. Thank you and see you next time.